I mean, we all have different words for what the main problem is. The main problem, I think, still is that too many of us don't understand that we can make decisions. But those in power haven't haven't understood that we can make a decision to destroy or decisions to enable. And I think that's just an observation that comes from working quite regularly in context where, where people are able to make decisions. And there's so much within a pattern of perpetuating uh, like destructive systems that they lost the ability to know that we can take other decisions. And whenever there's a suggestion to make other decisions, like from a feminist or de decolonial position, then the argument is, oh, no, we can't change things because that's how it is. But I think if you for the main problem, that really is the main problem that too many have forgotten that we can make decisions. Well, I think to insist, you know, to insist on the fact that it's a choice. I mean, I think that's what a lot of fe feminists theory and suggestions do to say, look, we can practice differently. And that's what a lot of people around me do to insist that you can use your, your means to either perpetuate racism, exploitation, patriarchy, or you can use your means to practice differently. So that's, of course, not a solution at all. But I think that's the first step to insist that there's a choice in a different way. But yeah, I think to, to keep working on those two levels of practicing differently, which is often small scale and slow, takes a lot of time and attention, but within the bigger argument insist that we, we want we want a different politics. But yeah, to both practice and use the experience of practice to insist that systemic change is possible. Because the system is so strong that we almost forget that other decisions are possible. You know, art art is a, is a niche. <laughs> so I think I do what like what we all do, that we like aim to practice the values we believe in, that we network. I mean, that's something I really learned from you and from the first Urban Act book that if we keep connecting, if we keep like building communities of practice, if we keep insisting that this is not um, a single attempt, but actually quite a widespread motivation, we can we can scale it up to a degree. And I think we all also try to influence policy wherever we are on the levels we have access to. So you are in solidarity with colleagues and others who have similar values. And you try to influence policy um, where you have access um, either to systems or through language or um, through skills. But but as, I, as an artist, I think I'm not different to anyone else in that sense. I think from with my inherited position of um, being able to proclaim and use autonomy within art, you know, this creative, artistic, cultural autonomy that artists are so given within the European tradition, this should be should be spread. Um, this should not be a privilege for the arts, but it should be a basic human conditions for, for everyone. But I quite like this term cultural democracy. So I don't like to be singled out as an artist because I think art is just one very particular form of cultural production, but it has certain uh, freedoms or privileges that other professions have lost. So that's why it's why it's important to reflect on artistic autonomy, but not to protect it, but to share it. So if I if I go back to this idea of um, artistic autonomy, so let's say with company drinks, it was joyful um, to proclaim that um, I will practice as an artist but I'm at the same time setting up a local drinks company. And you don't have to argue this too much because you can self-proclaim your position and you can self-proclaim your, your project. My main interest is to create social space, common space, space in where we have an understanding of um, each other and our shared resources and actually doing things together outside of 
um, more restrained concepts like a business or the family or the community. So Company Drinks was set up and it has very, very much changed um, in its 10 years. But it was set up around the idea of we're making drinks together and the whole production cycle, like in a usual company, would be streamlined. It would be um, taken away from the public. But within Company Drinks, the whole production cycle of growing, harvesting, making, enjoying, trading, reinvesting, each step in this production cycle was made public. And through this kind of continuous seasonal public cycle, you slowly create a new social and public realm um, where people meet on the base of their own interest, but they also meet in order to make and share something together. So you could just join because you want to go picking or you want a free drink. Um, but over the years, um, your position within the project might change um, from just being a visitor to becoming part of the collective and to becoming more involved in um, political work in the borough. So some have, others haven't. It's a very basic idea of commons that you actually become aware of what you have access to as a relatively loose group. We've worked with groups um, quite directly around food policies, um, politicizing, and it's it's been rejected to a degree um, because people don't necessarily identify with with that language that seems strange or seem, seems unfamiliar to them. We work with a less politicized language, but try to communicate more on council level um, what changes we want. But maybe I give an example. Cam Chavez, who has been in company drinks as long as I have, um, she's just published a, a food report for the council. And she's really done it in a super impressive way along our values. Um, like not to impose language, not to impose demands, um, but to very collaboratively and collectively research, have a community-led research um, that led to like 12 very concrete political demands to the council. It's how we how we phrase it and um, how as a, as a group they could bring it forward so everybody could identify with it. So the report was both a kind of bottom-up articulation of demands and a kind of more experience translating it into policy suggestions. I think so far, the most difficult moment um, was when we had to realize that we um, perpetuated racism to a degree, like literally organizationally. But yeah, we overcame this by actively issuing an anti-racism policy, by actively producing a toolkit, by actively rewriting all our policies, by very actively um, producing and discussing our code of conduct, and by very actively um, caring about the safeguarding of the space. That we still exist, <laughs> like quite literally. I think two out of five businesses in London go um, bankrupt after the, first, after the first two years. So of course the victory is that by being aware of our economy being a very diverse, we've built up a resilience um, that allows us to be relatively certain that we will exist because we know that we don't just rely on financial income, but we also rely, rely on all those other contributions which which we are aware of. So that's that's a victory, a certain resilience. Um, and if we distinguish between those who are paid part-time team, the key holders and visitors, like if we have those three groups in mind, um, I think from the paid part-time team, it's an appreciation that you actually can work on something you like and you get paid for it. You know, it's like meaningful paid work um, where you feel that you have a certain autonomy. For everybody else, and again, um, I'm quite careful here, who, who's coming back, there's an appreciation of um, 
the safeguarding of the space that's been established by now, or there's an acknowledgement of that a certain culture and val values are lived and it, it is non-discriminatory and there's processes if something would happen. It's a bit cheesy, but it is this idea of good company. So it's, it's, it's a very valuable social space where we care and always cook and have food. That's important, you know, like a culture of hosting and safeguarding. All the keyholder groups um, just acknowledge the fact that they can use the building for free for their own programs. It's a place where you can actually live and practice your values. It's very simple, but it's also quite rare. I mean, a lot of dissemination is um, relationship building, has to be said. I think like locally, the amount of time and care that goes into talking and listening and um, adapting is immense. But I think other than that, printed matter helps. I think language is actually really quite powerful here to carefully change the language. And I mean, it's, I think, you know, that's what I've really learned from like Catherine Gibson, that you don't have to be anti, you, you, you just, you propose your very own affirmative la language um, that still can incorporate all your values, but it's pointing towards something rather than rejecting something. You know, we started this, uh, the interdependence, which hasn't grown, but the basic idea was that many of us do similar things. How do we ma make this visible together um, to feel stronger, but also to feel that there's a scale to it. But a book where projects can see each other in neighborhood or in this idea of interdependence, um, that's, that's, that's very useful. From what position am I responding to those questions? As someone who who's the um, the initiator, clearly, yeah, the founder, but as someone who currently is less